Are we ready? Just roll it from you, because uh, Chris has got no idea. He can't remember why you want to come on the podcast. Can you? <laughs> uh, Chris Chris Royal, the uh, the more handsome, wouldn't be hard, and uh, but I'll rephrase that, less ugly brother of uh, Shit Lip Senior, Michael Royal, previous podcast guest, and you're the better shaven one as well. Yes. But you probably can't grow a beard, can you? I can. Bollocks. Uh, Facebook says otherwise. What do you mean? Well, a profile picture. You can't trust anything on Facebook, though. No. No, mate. Could be fake. No, they... no, he can't. Let's, uh, uh, cheers, buddy. Cheers, mate. Yeah. So, I remember why, 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 uh, why this, why this is happening now. Because after the eight hour guest party, you was spouting some crazy opinions in the pub the next morning, the hair and the dog breakfast. I can't remember what they were. But I just remember being bollocks. So, <laughs> so this is you uh, <laughs> calling me out? Yeah, no, 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 not at all. No, no, no. It was, it, I, it was an interesting discussion. Not that I can remember the subject. Neither no, can no, you. No. So, however, you rocked up quite aptly in a Power Edge uh, D Company three para uh, T-shirt, and today um, the debacle with uh, the bloody Sunday absolutely yeah. inquiry. Charges being announced, so they've announced that they're gonna. They've announced that they're charging one soldier. They're gonna. They're naming him. He's been known as Soldier F with the Bloody Sunday uh, killings. Oh, they're charging him with two counts of murder, four counts of attempted murder. They've there's there was twelve other people I think up for looking at having charges against them, as in uh, paras, and they've all been dropped on insufficient evidence. And there's also four. There was four civvies, I think, Irish civvies who were looking at getting charges against, and they've been dropped as well. So you just look at the ones, the one reg bloke. Uh, so, not that I'm a subject matter expert on that, but I think we should talk about it in general. What do you think? Happy? Yeah, yeah, happy. What do you think? Well, in fact, let's go back because some, some people listen to this. One of a fucking clear what it was. So, bloody bloody Sunday was a uh, an. The name given to an event happened in 1972 in Northern Ireland in um, Londonderry, uh, where a group of a unit of paratroopers, a company of paratroopers, was deployed to go and deal with a uh, to prevent a riot, deal with a riot situation going on. I don't remember. I don't know the details. Uh, and what happened at the end of the event was there were 13. I think were 13. I think were 13. 13 Irish. No, Northern Irish. Well, I, there were 30 Northern Irish Irish people killed. Catholics. Yeah, in that event. Um, and it was claimed that they were all innocent and the event was... It was just cold-blooded murder by the Paris. No, <clears throat> 1972 is a fucking long time ago, right? I don't know, is there anything you want to add to that? What I just described? No, 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 it's no. 1972 is a long time ago. Um, that doesn't excuse like war crimes or... Or crime, uh, you know, um, any crimes really for that length of time. But this has been going on for ages. And what can you remember? What happened with the Savile Inquiry? Everyone was found. It was basically found there was no charges to be pressed, wasn't it? The Savile yeah. Inquiry. Yeah. I can't. I don't understand. This has come about then. I heard last year <clears throat> how this came, how what I heard last year was all of a sudden hundreds and hundreds of soldiers. Um, uh, Power Edge, sorry, Paris from, the, from Power Edge had been getting basically a blanket letter had been getting sent out by the coroner to just blank to everyone who had served in the military at that time, right? Of of the Bloody Sunday uh, drama, and uh, it was something along it said it was something along the lines of um, were you in were you serving in Northern Ireland at this time? Uh, were you ever around this year da, 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 were you in this area and depending on what you said basically yes or no depending on whether you got a knock on the door from the flipping police or not um, to come in and it was just like a cast you know cast a, cast a net and see what we can catch which is where we're at now um, however I was lucky enough in January or was it December last year to be taking uh, a healer man unnamed at the moment to be taking an, an author um, to an appointment he had. A well known military historian, right? And we were talking there in the car, because this had, this, we were talking about this, obviously before today's events. It wasn't quite as stupid as it got today. 
But I said to him, I said, we'll call him John. I said, John, you you did stuff around that instant, you know, as in interviews, books, articles. And he said, yeah. I said, what happened? I said, well, what really happened, you know, on the ground? I said, did, did, did were they, lun- like, with the power edge flipping? Were they lunatics? Was it originally, literally? Because it, it, could, it could, you know, Chris, it could be as simple as, you can get you can get maniacs in any organization you could it's entirely plausible you had a maniac or maniacs or a unit a section with a bad you know just a bad bad morals bad ethics around them and just, one of them decides i'm going to brass the fucking place up is that chance yeah gonna do. exactly right um entirely plausible now when i was talking to john about this he said he said there was there's a bunch of things he said but what he does know so he, he he said they actually came so when these letters got cast out last year and into the beginning of this year still looking for witnesses flipping protagonists right he said that they actually the authorities actually came to him as well because he's the only guy to his knowledge that has interviewed properly and formally albeit for his um, publications a lot of the people who were there at the time and not long after it happened and he also interviewed a lot of the civvies. Not a lot of the civvies. He interviewed a number of civvies that were happy to be interviewed with him. And what, so he was saying that basically, I, the story always got told to me, coming up through the reg, was right, yeah, a bunch of people got killed. However, the claim that there was no IRA shooters there is bollocks. Um, the claim that there was, there was no IRA presence there, a terrorist presence there, is bollocks. And what I got told was that there were, Weapons were getting taken off the bodies. So a, te- a shooter got, got killed. They'd take the weapon away, so they'd be like, oh, he's an innocent person. I actually don't dispute the fact that innocent people got killed that day. I, I don't think you can even dispute that. No. I, I think I, absolutely, right? How how and why the events unfolded is where, is, where the amb- is where the ambiguity lies. Now, what John said is that's one thing. Yes, there was weapons getting taken away from the, from the bodies. Uh, yes, possibly some innocent civilians got killed he said but also there were whole bodies got taken away so there were terrorists that shot it wasn't just take the weapons they took the bodies away because these people were known terrorists to the to the ARD to the authorities to the RUC and all the rest of it and they were taking the whole bodies away so it was more than just 13 killed you know as as others just just took them away and that's what he said and he's a guy I trust and he had no he had no reason to lie, lie to me um what do you think about? Uh, do you think there should be a time limit imposed on uh, how long after an event you can be prosecuted? And should we let's talk about military? Well, I think it's all I think it's all situation dependent, really. I think if you can bring in new evidence which contradicts the initial decision that was made, then I think yeah, possibly you should go back to trial. But I don't think. There isn't any new information. Everything's already been in the press, so it's just continuing on from that. I don't think it's well. I wonder what's been found then, though, to be able to for them to be con- confident they can press charges now when the Savile Inquiry found nothing. No, it was the Savile Inquiry, wasn't it? Mm. Savile Inquiry. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Because the thing is, you, you, you could a lot of. I mean, there is a lot of calls at the moment for. It's too long ago. You, you should, what, you know, you should be able to not get away with things. It should be, it should be a point where you go, that's it now. Like, you can't go doing people. But then, there's still war crimes pro- prosecutions going now for the Second World War. Yeah. You know, it's, I, 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 I'm not against, I do think you should be held accountable. You are wrong. You should be held accountable. However, the amount of appeals and, and investigations and, this that, and the other that that should can be should be allowed to be done as you say without the without fresh evidence significant fresh evidence should that should be limited yeah for me if the Savile inquiry found everyone's innocent unless there's some new information right and that's and when i say new information it needs to be hard information hard evidence right it what it can't be is someone's a new person or someone's opinion on, on the events because even just 10 years ago, flipping heck, you try describing what happened 10 years ago. 
you get it wrong half the time. Yeah. I, 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 uh, there was an incident in, uh, Afghan in, on the, on 2006. And, um, a few weeks later after he got back, we had military police come and speak to us just to, it was all to do with when we were going to go and do the, um, what you call it? The, when they, um, look at, investigate the deaths with the coroner, uh, the, uh, Oh, man. Well, they try and work out the court, what happened, the cause of death. Uh, the inquest, right? It's for the inquest. Now, so we, we were sat in Kabul waiting to get the plane, and the MPs going to spoke to us. Me, Jared, um, a lot of guys from Easy Company. This is after Musakala. Mm hmm. Yep. Um, it was for, yeah, it was for instant, yeah, actually. And it was three of us, right? So Jared and I were first in the scene, and it was uh, two medics there coming straight after us, right? I give my version of events. When I say version of events, I just record because nothing wrong went happened. It was just trying to work out right. Um, when I give my what happened in my head, and then so we were all we were all interviewed separately. You know, not like we were in a flipping naffy, not a naffy, but like a yeah, you know, like a, like a mili- yeah, like a little cafe area in, yeah. in camp. And uh, so I give my version of events, and then we got together after, as in just like the, the MPs buggered off, and then um, we were just chatting. And I, uh, and we were talking about it. Like, we were recalling the event, basically. And one, and one, and Jared said something. I said, that's not what happened. I said, nah, mate, that, this happened first, not that. Um, and it, what it was, it, if I want to explain it a bit. And he said, no, that's, no, it happened the other way around you. I said, nah, no way I remember. And then the true medics came and went, yeah, you, you know, it, this is the way it happened, not the way you said it. And I can blind, Blind, you know, it was just a simple chain of events thing. I had it completely wrong. I couldn't believe it. And those three, three right. It wasn't critical to anything, but the reason I'm saying that, that was weeks after an event. 47 years later, what was it? Yeah, 47 years later, you know. So maybe the, maybe the, um, maybe the limit should be on those kind of investigations on, okay, it has to be substantial evidence, be new evidence being brought forward based on, I don't know, like DNA and, yeah. or, or some, you know, weapons or, I don't know, uh, ballistic information. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think that anybody's, if anybody turned around and recollected something that happened on that day and used it uh, now as evidence, I think it's unsubstantial, really. I don't think you could use it. No, I wonder what it is. I wish I, I wish I had time to, to read it more today to work it out. Absolutely, it's, uh, it's not a good situation at all. I, I do think as well that a lot of it's to do with, um, I do think as well that a lot of, a lot of. The way this has come back about, a lot of pressure from Ireland, especially with the IRA dramas going on and and uh, um, and the unrest over there at the moment, it's almost like a lot of countries and doing organisation organisations and stuff capitalising on the unrest in the UK with Brexit. I've missed that. I was away last week, so I only got snippets of what what's been going on with the IRA anyway. Uh, uh, postal bombs. Yeah. Yeah, and they, 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 I think they were investigating whether they were down at the IRA. Basically, these bombs were posted. They were small things, right? But, you know, they were flipping to damage. But they were, the, they were posted from a Irish, you know. But when I hear that, I think, in fact, I was going to say, I think, oh, God, that's a bit obvious, isn't it? But then, they don't hide that anyway. They, cause they're going to claim it, aren't they? I did, well, I, I, I'm not sure the IRA claimed it, actually. Not sure. Know. I'm not sure. I don't know. This is this is like ten minutes of we're not sure of any information. I was, like I said, I was away, I was away last week skiing, so um, missed it all. Who were you skiing with? Uh, skiing with the territorials. Well, they're not called the territorials anymore. The the army reserve. Ah uh, yes, mm. we talked about this, didn't we? Yeah. What unit? Four Mercians. <laughs> Are you proud of that? Uh, to be honest with you, mate, they're actually a good bunch I'm of guys. Joking. They're a good bunch of guys. No, no, it was no, it's no disrespect to the Mercians. It's, it's like you know, where well, you know, but you know, well, par edge like for any, I, well, like, any unit transferred to any unit. Oh God, I remember going uh, going to go to TA um, a few years after I left. I, I can't remember what I wanted to do. I think it's just extend my pension, get pension going and all that. Yeah, and um, there was a local unit. It was like medics. And then we sick and we were talking a few hundred meters from the house where I was living at the time. Medic medical regiment and signals regiment. I thought, right, oh God, it's gonna do I'll do medic I'll do I'll do med I'll do med reg. I, I can swallow that. Yeah, I'll be alright. Wear that cat badge. Went over there, they had no space. And then it was like SIGS is the only option. I, like, <laughs> I didn't know about that. But then 
But then but that's fair enough because it's got a trade, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. How many days do you have to do with? with uh... It's twenty-seven days a year yeah. commitment. But the the actual financial benefit for somebody who's ex regs is actually really good. Why is that? You get an extra. You get your normal bounty from doing them. Your twenty-seven days commitment, but you also get um, a ten grand bonus over your first four years. Plus, you pay on top. You know, it's mm. it's pretty good. So, because you've got something to offer back to the for training purposes, you know, because you're a regular bloke. When did you go? Two thousand fifteen. Ah, what, you go to lunch track or Tom? Lunch track. Yeah. Lunch track. Did you keep your rank? Yeah. Did you? Mm-hmm. When I went to the medics. Yeah, but they probably just looked you up and down, didn't they? <laughs> no. <laughs> ah, I think it's four years. <laughs> it's what, Tanya? I think it's four years. It was a time limit, and you just you just lose lose everything. Yeah, because yeah, it was because it was within that period. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah. But then you don't have to do that much to get back up to that rank anyway. No. Because yeah. you've already yeah. done it once. I can't remember what I was doing. I was just money. I think it was just money and pension. Yeah. But then it's nice to get back into the uniform, I think, in a strange kind of way. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's just, it's a bit of, you know, I can go there and it's just back to the old ways. What do you do then? Get, oh. So when's your next day? When are you going next? Well, it's usually every Tuesday night. What do you do? It's just PT. Turn up, do get, go up, turn up a bit earlier, do a bit of PT. What, voluntarily turn up earlier? Yeah, yeah. Who does the PT? There's a PTI there. Okay. So it's they have, right, okay, yeah. So you go there, do PT. Go to uh, do PT, and then you go and do some lessons, just normal, usual lessons that you normally do. So, map reading lessons, that sort of stuff, weapons handling tests, all that sort of. Do you not get annoyed by? It? Is it correct me wrong? But it's not a quite a basic level with with them, army reserves, and that's no disrespect to any TA listening. The reason I'm saying it is obviously because you, Chris, were um, part of Edge regular for flipping years, and then. I would think with with TA is sort of a, pitched a different level because they they haven't got the advantage of smashing you every day with loads of information. Well, I'm in anti tanks, so they do a lot on you know anti tanks weapons and um, tank recognition that sort of thing. But then I can also do I can also go and do lessons myself. So I'm already planning on doing like some sniper interest lessons. You know, just you so mean you can I can do- take the lessons. Ah, mega. Mm. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So and you know I'm already you know from from taking from an ex reg point of view, go in teaching, you know, the 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 reserves on, you know stuff that I learned when I was in the, the mm. army. Do you know how much of it you've forgotten? Well, quite a bit. But then I look at Pam and then I'm just back onto it again. Yeah. Did you keep your sniper folder in the course? Um. Yeah, it's in my um best book. Yeah, best book. Yeah, yeah mate. <laughs> That, uh, when I when I went on uh, that when I went on that sniper course, I thought I I thought I'd seen the worst of the acronyms and all that, and then you go on the sniper course and it's fucking hell, even more meant PW Camdras. Remember that one? <laughs> yeah. Remember PW yeah, Camdras? Yeah. Well, was that it's a root selection, wasn't it? Like root, I think it was, was it root selection, yeah. sniper root selection. Yeah, is it ploughed fields? Ploughed fields, wildlife, yeah. um, f- fucking all oh, PW Camdras. <laughs> <laughs> Mental. Absolutely mental, and then all the, ma- the mathematics side of it. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, that was that was that was. I thought that I found that really fascinating, actually. Probably because I'm a bit of a fucking Barlow, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the fucking using your mill rads and that, and finding out how far away somebody was. I thought it was fucking mega. Well, I, mean, I, yeah. I, 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 that's the thing. What I, what I couldn't realise when I did that course, and I wanted to do sniping, you mm. know, in, in battalion, is that it, one, it's a lot like learning to drive. You don't really start learning to drive until you pass the test, right? But also, the shooting aspect is the easiest. Yeah, yeah. it's the easiest. When you when you get to the point of your fingers in the trigger, that is that's it. All the hard work's done. All you got to do now is like is get the crosshairs on the target and flip and kill him. Yeah, I was gonna say all her then, right? <laughs> <laughs> we got to be uh, we got to be equal, equal opportunities, yeah, haven't yeah. we? <laughs> um, yeah, because this is the easiest part. It's like, and that's why when you work in pairs. The other thing, like you work in pairs, the, the, the person who's spotting, so the person with the rifle is generally the less experienced one. The person who's spotting is the one who's got the more experience because they, because they got all of the mental, all the mental workings out. Like, uh, yeah, the maths. And then you know, my favorite thing, what I learned on the sniper course. Go on. And I, this is my, uh, I used to be like a party line. You know, like, oh, yeah. Um, did you know this? So it's the, uh, okay. So imagine now, Mr. Civ Pop. 
Let's see if you remember this. I want to see if you remember this now, Chris. Go on. If you were, let's say you're on the ground, yeah, and you're shooting up at a target, right? Oh, hang on. Okay, it's fine now. Yeah, you're shooting up at a target. Target's on, I don't know, on top of a flipping skyscraper, a kilometer up and away, right? You're shooting up at that person. Well, you haven't adjusted your sights, you're not aiming off. Your crosshairs as if you were shooting him 100 meters away on the ground, right? So, so you're aiming up a kilometer away. Oh, not a kilometer. A, a, a fucking 100 meters away. When you shoot, is the round going to land below the cro- where the crosshairs are, on the crosshairs, or above? So you, is it going to go higher or lower? Set to the same distance that your right. target so, was at. Yeah, so you're... So that, yeah. so it, it's going to hit the target because it only gets affected... Because it's at an angle, it gets affected more by the wind, but the distance is still the same. No. <laughs> no. It goes over. It goes above. Does it? Yeah. Because because there's less gravity effect in it. So line of sight now. So hundred me- so hundred meters from me to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So hundred meters from me to you. You're so we're level. You're hundred meters away from me on the road. Yeah. I'm like yeah. the same at you through the sights. Let's say I'm fucking. Well, I won't have any clicks on it, right? Yeah. That's it. Now I put you a hundred meters away from me on a roof. Hundred meters line of sight on the roof. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's still the same distance from me to you on the roof. Yeah. Still the same distance. Right. Yeah. Right. Pull the trigger. Shoot, the round's going to land high because there's less distant, less gravity effect in. So your 100 meters line of sight, maybe you think when you look at the, tri- you look at a triangle, it's 100 meters, yeah, it's like, um, I don't know what the name of the triangle is. You've got a long side with hypotenuse, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the 100 meters. Then the bottom, that's, the bottom is shorter than the hypotenuse, yeah? Well, that's the amount of gravity effect in the shot. So it's less, gra- the bullet's traveling the same distance because it's going up at an angle. There's only like 75 meters worth of gravity affecting the bullet. See? Mm. It goes higher. <sighs> it's an old sweat thing, mate. I'll take it through it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Always gets people going. Mm. You probably just don't remember it properly. No, I don't. Yeah, you don't. Um, when did you join up with TA? Um, joined TA. Probably about a year ago now. What do you mean? Oh, okay. So, what did you do when you got out? Um, Hang on a minute. Why did you get out? Um, don't have to go on to if you don't know. No, it's all right. Um, so, um, I was in a situation where whatever happened with Michael happened, and I was like, I can't be bothered working with some some particular guys anymore. Yeah. So. Oh, so yeah. I made that decision. Yeah, because it's one you thing. You weren't happy in the workplace anymore. No, no, I wasn't. I mean, it's the best job I've ever had. You know, and I loved it. And uh, you know, I've got some really good friends from it. But I, just a few particular people. Mm. After Michael's career, like you know, and he was re- one of the best soldiers I've ever met. You know, he, he's my brother, I said. But and uh, just the way he was treated before he got out. Some of the people they don't really want to work with anymore. So yeah, he's he's uh, he won't mind saying shit lips. He's uh, he's a funny one. He's one of those guys. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what what sh- what podcast he's on. I'm sure, it's number ten or something. Right? Number fourteen or something like that was it? Something like that. Yeah. Um, he's one of those guys because 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 <laughs> of his personality. Mm. He's either either like. If you only met him a few times, Ma, might. you either love him or you hate him. But then as you get to know him more, yeah. and you're around, and like, with, yeah, right. and as you got, yeah, you, you learn actually, all right, he's just got a bit of a crazy personality. He's got some weird mannerisms. And uh, he's not actually an arrogant wank. He'd do anything for, he'd do anything for you. He'd do anything. Brilliant guy. Brilliant guy. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. He pissed a lot of people off, but without, without doing anything. No, no. That was just his, uh... <laughs> and, and at the same time, people didn't like, a lot of people didn't like him just for the sake of <laughs> meeting him once and going, <laughs> yeah. But then you get people like that, then yeah. 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 He was a cheesy, you annoying bastard. Uh, <laughs> you got out and did what? Um, I got out, went into the building actually. I went out and started doing a bit of building. Then I um, started up my own company in 2016. I didn't know that, okay. Yeah, it was a short-lived company anyway. It was... Um, it was a what, sorry? It didn't last very long. Right, yeah. So I started it with a couple of business partners. And it was um, plastic processing. So we'd get plastic in, 
we granulate it so i do all the i do all the maintenance on the machines run the machines um process it it'll get granulated sent off for pelletizing and then it get used into uh being used into plastic again can you use that for 3d printing no um well you could do yeah but usually you have to um depending on what kind of gray plastic it is you have to mix it in with um some um virgin plastic so depending on because uh, yeah. it's all this is all used plastic so if you talk about all your um underground piping you know old car parts that are used when um plus it can be hard plastic doesn't matter if it's hard or soft or well you'd, you'd mix it up right yeah so this is all it's polyprop um high density polyethylene all that sort of thing every kind of plastic granulated up and it gets reused again mm. it's just basically recycling yeah, but but the, the ass fell out of recycling, isn't it? Mm. Within, with la- within the last couple of years, fallen right out of yeah. recycling. Yeah, well, the um, the Chinese were taking a lot actually, because they were they were just buying it on mass. You know, tons and tons of it were coming into the country every day, and they were just stockpiling it because they it was nothing to them. So they were stockpiling it because they know you'd, they'd use it to make uh, toy manufacturing and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> so, or just and, cheaper parts and, you could buy on eBay. And they stopped taking it, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, and it's just ruined the industry. Yeah, ruined it, absolutely ruined it. Yeah, I remember that. Have you heard of um, just on the subject of starting your own business? Have you heard of uh, Heropreneurs? No. Oh, mate! If by chance you ever thinking of starting another business mm-hmm. at some point, right? There's a company called an organisation called Heropreneurs. Now, I don't know loads about it, but Bag, have you listened to Bags's podcast? No. The Tanky, um, Bare Arms military film and advising the uh, bags ex tanky officer i will do that he's I mean, he dropped some knowledge bombs i mean he did yeah uh so I, I met up with him for a beer oh a couple of weeks back in london and he was saying he just uh he, he joined this organization called heropreneurs and he, basically what it is is um you apply to heropreneurs to get a mentor a business mentor and so he and his business is established. He's doing well, but he's like, okay, I need some personal coaching, business coaching. So he applied to Heropreneurs, and he uh, doesn't cost you anything, right? He has to be a veteran. And it's obviously some criteria. I don't know, but I would have thought the criteria, like if anything, the criteria would be if you've got an established business, you can bugger off. You don't need it. Yeah. But he is doing well, you know. And anyway, he got it, and, f- and fair play. And he said that. So the guy he's got is some. He said you'd expect some bum. Oh, not a bum, but some buckshy person, you know, got to cut their own companies and whatever. You wouldn't expect anyone of significance like, um, I don't know, some of Dragon's Den walking Richard in. Branson. Yeah, Richard Branson. <laughs> and, uh, he got, he said he, he, he said he got, he's got this business coach now who's got, who's got a multi million pound. One of his businesses is like a multi million. This guy is basically mega, like a mega successful guy. Bags had already heard of him. He's not selling money, but Bags had already heard of him or, or a couple of his businesses. And this guy now is Bags' business coach through Heropreneurs. I said, like, fucking hell. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to get hold of it. Yeah. Mega. Heropreneurs. Heropreneurs. So if you do ever think of starting a business, because you started one before, I'll guarantee you'll start one again at some point, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Might start a dog grooming company. Or is it dog walking company? What's he doing now? Oh, Jared. Don't walk him. Yeah, he could be grooming as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> Moving swiftly on. Uh, yeah. Mate, yeah. He does well with that, though. Yep. Yeah, mate, he he, he... 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 keeps fit every day by walking flipping dogs. Yeah. He loves dogs, so he's around dogs. And he's outdoors. Yeah. And he earns from it. Like, properly earns. It's mega. <laughs> Yeah, People love him. Brilliant. People love Jared. Yeah. They flip and love him. Yeah, more than the dogs. More than the dogs. <laughs> they probably they probably pay him out of sympathy a little bit as well. He has that. Jar- yeah, because he's only living around yeah. the corner, isn't he? Sympathy because he's oh he's so in love with animals. No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, he's around the corner. Yeah, I know you're talking shit. Yeah, right. I'm remembering vaguely the um the pub conversation. Okay, go on. right. We were on about environment. Were we uh, not? Yes. Um, more than likely, yeah. Yeah, we were, yeah. Well, you were on about environment. I'm trying to remember we got into it. And you were talking about a... There's a machine now. It's not often I disagree with people when they talk about climate change okay. and environment, right? Mm-hmm. You were talking about a machine 
takes carbon out of the atmosphere. Ah, right. Right. Can you remember that? I do, yeah. Tell me about that. Well, are we doing the right thing in a minute? Sorry? Environmentally. What, 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 are we going the right way with what we're doing? Is it all accurate? Hmm. Well, it depends on how much. How strongly do you feel about the environment? Oh, really strongly, actually. Let's do it now. I mean, I think ever since I've had this um, actual plastic company, I think I've really actually realised how much waste, you know, we produce plastic waste. And then obviously they did that um, Blue Planet, you know, the Blue Planet episode where it's all about plastic waste. I haven't seen it. Have you not? Blue Planet 2. Yeah. I, I have not seen it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Bad. It's bad. So shitloads of plastic, you know, just in the oceans um, getting eaten by, you know, um, whales, you know, all that sort of thing, you know. It's all just, it's all gets broken down into, into the sea and then it just gets eaten by fish and they die from it, basically. But how much of an impact is that on the, on the, on the, on the population of fish and and uh whales and stuff well only time will tell but it, but the thing is though once it's ingested by our food source we start ingesting it as well yeah <laughs> which which nobody knows what kind of effect that's going to have in the future anyway hmm yeah yeah i would have thought i have <clears throat> no i'm not i don't just to clarify i'm not disagreeing with it mm-hmm. climate change not disagreeing that we should do important things in the environment, yeah. 100%. In fact, I listened to a podcast the other day, and um, it was pretty fucking frightening, actually, about the actual state we're in yeah. with um, with global warming. It's, but that's for a different discussion, maybe. Uh, but I would have thought with the plastic side of things, mm-hmm. we would we would definitely be seeing some impacts now, as in going, right, illnesses mm-hmm. and diseases caused by plastic. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, are we? Well... Because I know, like, heavy metal is an issue. Heavy metal. Yeah. So Mining heavy metal. Because it's non-toxic. Pardon? Because it's non-toxic. What is? What? No, uh, what's what's the one um, What's the one you get from eating uh, ground, bottom feeding fish? Oh, right. Uh What do they... Uh, not not mercury. Arsenic. Fucking arsenic. Arsenic. Yeah, yeah. arsenic, yeah. yeah. So you can get, like, really poorly off that. If you eat, lot, if you eat load, shitloads of sardines, like, loads, like, every day. You can get a high level of arsenic in your body, and that's from that's from shit sinking to the bottom of the ocean from pollution, right? Mm. Um, so I would have thought now if that we would have thought it's quite small, an imp- uh, a small uh, a cause, but the impact is you can measure it, like from arsenic and turn it back to eating loads of bottom feeding fish. I would have thought the plastic would be quite obvious. Well, it's. Um well, it's it's definitely making an impact on the ocean anyway. So it's all of this plastic. It's mostly third world countries actually, where they've got no process of actually dealing with plastic and they don't recycle. So we're shipping, you know, tons and tons of plastic bottles, wrappers, all that stuff to third world countries, and that inevitably is getting washed into the seas, uh, into the into the rivers, and washed down into the oceans. So it's all pollution. And it's all based on um, all your base products, really. Most plastics are. Mm. Um, are there plastics that are not? Then? Um, well, I think nylon's a chemical reaction, isn't it? Nylon's plastic. Nylon is, yeah. Is it? It's like a plastic. I oh, didn't know that. Yeah, I thought nylon was nylon. Is it? Pla- it's plastic. It's a man-made product. Hang on, hang on. You're losing me. Here. Right. Nylon, oh. nylon is a... I know nylon's a, man-made. Yeah, so it's a chemical reaction, but it's still plastic. Still classified, is it? Yeah, it's still classified as plastic, yeah. You make, um, they make um, big blocks of it. I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought nylon was nylon. No. What else is plastic that's not called plastic? Well, it's just a type. It's just a different type of plastic, that's all it is. What's so the definition got, of plastic, then? I don't know. I, c- I couldn't tell you. Right. Plastic is a... Plastic. But nylon's nylon. Yeah. But it's still plastic. <sighs> so confusing. Right, okay. Really? So, did you were you recycling nylon? I was, I was recycling nylon, yeah. How did you do that? It's a similar way. It's just um, granulating it, pelletising it. When you say then, granulating it, what do you mean? So, it'll come in... Um, usually, I'd, we'd have products come in which are mismade. That's that's the usual thing that we get. Or we get recycled stuff, so stuff that will come in and yeah. we bite in. It'll then go through a granulator. So, it'll go through a, granulator, a shredding machine first into a shredding machine and it'll get broken down into large parts and it'll go into the granulator and then it'll get granulated up. Then it'll go through a heat process 
this was, was a part of that as it'll get shipped away go through a heat process then it'll get pelletized usually mixed in with a, a virgin which is a new plastic which will mm-hmm. be made like an oil based plastic and then it'll be mixed in with it and then it'll get reused again so that was it that was just the the recycling thing and I was quite happy doing that you know because it was actually you know I knew, I was, no, it wasn't going to landfill you know that sort of thing mm. which I don't think it should do I'm feeling like what we're talking about our death of knowledge is not excessive enough no. extensive enough no. what do you think yeah good let's get on to something else then <laughs> <laughs> yep you talk about um Simon in the Reg yeah sure yeah which is, right cool excellent so, so hang on oh what you go on you go talk away then I was going to ask you a question <laughs> so I, I, jo- I, jo- I joined up in I joined up in 2008. At the time, I think Free Power were on um, Herrick. What would it be, Herrick? Uh, Herrick. Uh, uh, eight, uh, Herrick. Uh, hang you on. were on it. Eight, I don't know, hang on. Herrick 4. Herrick, Her- Herrick 4. Herrick 4. Herrick. It's Herrick 8. Herrick 8. Yeah. So by the time I got. I was in Battalion. I was in Depot in yeah, 2000, eight, yeah. Yeah. 2008. So by the time I got out, everyone just come back from that tour. So I missed that tour. So I was in. Um, um, battalion for two years before we went to our next next tour, which was Herrick 13. At that time, I think I joined Snipers in... 13. Two, sorry? 13. Herrick 13, sorry. Yeah. I, uh, I joined Snipers in uh, 2010. Where were you before then? Uh, I was in Free Platoon. Oh, yeah, you were with me, weren't you? <laughs> I've, was that a genuine question? Yes. <laughs> Before you went to snipers, you were one of my guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, mate. <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Fucking hell. Was Jared in the platoon when you rocked up? Yeah, yeah. That oh, was mega. Yeah. Were you there when Dave jumped out the window? Yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> Dave the dog. Those people. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> ah, right. So you came to Italian, came straight to me. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, and then you went from me to snipers. Yeah. Yes. Now I remember you and Lewis. Uh, Lewis Hendry went as well. He no. Was, he went patrols. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Lewis went patrols, yeah, mega. Right, so, snipers. And then when you when we deployed on Herrick 13, mm-hmm. tell me that. What? Uh, wh- when did you go on? Wh- who, would, who would you go out with? Uh, so I was attached to a company. Uh, we went to Nadi Ali North, but that was the whole of... Um, Which, uh, you were in Quadrat, weren't you? Um, well, the, I was with Briggsy at the time. So me and yeah. Briggsy were a pair. Uh, the other pair was um, Joe Mitten and somebody else. Yeah. Um, who we're not allowed to mention, apparently. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we were basically, we. Uh, I think they initially got sent to Folad, Joe and, and then me and Briggsy went to Zulfakar. Did you ever go to Zulfakar? Zulfakar. Where was Zulfakar? It was a checkpoint. It was. Um, oh, on a little one. The, yeah, yeah. Sharky's yeah. Um, checkpoint. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we were there. Yeah. And. Uh, me and Briggsy got sent there. We was just to, you know, see what was going on. A few things happened, not that much really. It was pretty quiet. And then they decided they wanted to build a, a new um, checkpoint down the road. Which Nam, was... Nam Mohammed? Nor Mohammed. Nor Mohammed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. When um, when you uh, when you joined up, so mm-hmm. depot. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, what were what was it like in training? See, when I joined up, right in two thousand, so I went through training. Yeah, there was no, there'd be no real combat operations. Well, I mean, like a Sierra Leone that happened. When did Sierra Leone happen? Sierra Leone was happening as I was in depot, as in the rescue operation with Hereford and One Power, right? Um, and, and PF. Uh, so, but really, there was nothing of significance that my ins. Screws and that had done, and the platoon sergeant that had done. Um, yeah, it was significant as in combat significance. Mm-hmm. What was it like? How did you find depot in that regard? Well, you did mean, didn't the knowing that you're going to go into a war zone that, but as well, yeah, so that how did how did you find that? Well, I'd obviously thought about it beforehand. I mean, you know, it was and you had your brother as well, yeah, so it's a it's a Whatever. What did your brother say to you about it? How did your brother? What did your brother before you joined up, right? And he was in, knowing how how much of a nightmare it was. <laughs> how did he? Why did you still join up? Well, how did he say it to you? What did Cheesy say to you? Um, well, I think it was always. In- <laughs> did he encourage you or discourage you? 
No, he encouraged me really. You know, yeah. he said it would be a you know it's a, it's a good lifestyle, and it and it is. It was the best job I've ever had. Like I say, did you have the conversation with him? How, how did it go? Tell me about when you decided to join up. Well, I decided to join up because I've always wanted to join the Paras anyway. Yeah, and then I think uh, when before I was, your brother joined. Yeah, when I was a kid. You know. Okay. Uh, what's the age difference? Uh, t- two years. Right. Okay. Okay. So when I was a kid, I always wanted to join the Paras, but then Granddad and Dad were Paras anyway. Um. So he joined up, and he joined up at 16, and he joined the um, Army Foundation College. He turned around to me and said, uh, mm, yeah, you won't like it. So I just was like, oh, fuck it, I won't bother. I'll just wait till I'm old enough then to go and join in. And then by the time I was 18, I was out getting smashed. You Expl- know. Explain the AFC, people listening who don't know. Oh, sorry, AFC is uh, Army Foundation College, which is um, it's an all-units um, like training establishment where you um, – I think you can go through. Can you go through A levels and stuff like that? I think so. Yeah, you can basically go further education, but it's all it's it's under a military. Um, you can join it at sixteen. Yeah, you can join it at sixteen. So. It's a longer training process. Yeah, you have it? to have parental permission. It's a year and a half, well. isn't it? Um, mm, um, no, I don't think it is a year and a half. It's I think you do a year time. for your f- um, phase one. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so, so your phase one is a year, but then you also do extra education as you're going through. Yeah, but phase one is normally eight months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. your phase one is. Um, a lot longer. Mm-hmm. Um, so he said to me, he said, oh, you won't like it. And the alt- sorry, and, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah? And the alternative to that is, is that you join up, you just join as a, not Army Foundation College, you mm-hmm. just join up as a regular and you go normal and uh, eight months of training for phase one training and yeah, phase two is your continuation training and sometimes it's a phase three. Right? Yeah. So, okay. So, cool. Whereas Power Edge Depot is uh, 28 weeks combined, phase one and two. Okay. Yeah. Um, Anyway, yeah, so he said, I wouldn't like it. So and then by the time I got... Do you want this? Yeah, yeah. I was, by the time I was um, 18, I was out getting smashed, uh, and I just really lost sight of uh, why I wanted to join the army anyway. Mm-hmm. And then um, I think the situation arose where I was... <laughs> at home was a bit difficult, so um, I decided that I was going to do join the army then, and uh, I just signed on the line and went and joined. Straight into... Uh, where did you do training? All in Catrick Cat- now? Yeah, it's all in Catrick. When Catrick, you did it, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what was when you were going to training? Did, did um, Cheesy give you any help or anything? Uh, he gave me a lift there. He gave you a lift. Yeah, I bet he didn't give you any help, did he? <laughs> no, he wouldn't do either. No. Um, who are you? Who are your instructors? Um, you, well, the ones you can mention. In fact, don't mention any of them. What were they like? What were your instructors like? They sound yeah. The cunts because they have to be. <laughs> they are. Yeah. They're just hard on you, aren't they? That's yeah. what Paris Depot is. So they. They put you through your paces. They treat you like shit your whole 28 weeks. But mm. that's what they're there for. They're there to t- turn you into somebody who can actually handle the pressure. Um, and that's what that's what Power Edge Depot is all about. Mm. I mean, nobody nobody is a cunt. They just... <laughs> they're just... Uh, arguable. Okay, true. Yeah, <laughs> right. But, but they're there. They're there to be... <laughs> they're there to mould you and turn you into somebody else that, you know, a trained soldier, so... Mm. And it is a hard course, it, physically demanding and mentally, and that's what it's there for, to turn you into a good soldier. Mm. I was, um, you know, on your pe- I was talking to Luke Hardy the other day, mm-hmm. and I was talking to the producer of um, Paris Men of War. Um, the, oh right, the, 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 the three part, yeah, yeah. So I was talking to the, or one of the producers, right? yeah. I think, well, I think she's one of the producers. She was on the crew, anyway. I'm sure she's one of the producers, right? Mm-hmm. And um. We end up with a conversation of what what was your pee company like, and we were saying to her what was the pee company like. Did, did, did they get thra- like on the way to the events and on the way back? Did they get thrashed? And and uh, I remember I don't that was like for you. And again, it very some like t- 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 yeah. And man, my 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 depot I instructors when I was a recruit. Oh god, some of them were mega. There was one absolute nightmare, nightmare, and he was like the alpha of all the screws. Mm. You, and he was also the complete wanker. Yeah, like oh my god. And um, on the way to the peak Country events, we would get thrashed. We, you know, before you go into the tunnel to the fence, we on the way to the event, you get thrashed. So before you go into this, so people listening don't, don't understand, right? Like, <laughs> right. on the way, so that at the end of when you do your power race training, you go all the way through, right? This Catrick as well. Yeah, yeah. I do in phase one, literally, and in phase two, contract. So at the end of uh, at the end of your training with the paras, you have a there's a 
so you can pass all that. You can do all pass all the te- all like normal standard military tests. And at the end of Power Edge, well, in fact, you probably not have Power Edge anymore if you watched it. You have a selection process, and uh, it's a, it's it's around it's it's t- it's all around physical events over ten days, but it's testing your physical and, and mental strength, ability, and ag- agility. So the idea is you go and go on to the events, you do as best you can on the physical events. Perform as best you can. Some of them team events, some of individual events. So when I was in depot, and this is the same for other people, it's not the same for all people though. When we were like marching to the start point for the event, we would leave early. Our instructors would would get us up early. We'd leave early, like by ten, fifteen, twenty minutes from the barracks, where the, the accommodation. So on the way to this physical event that we had to pass to get into the paras, they would thrash us physically for 10, 15 minutes before we got to that event. So by the time we got to the event, we were fucked. <laughs> and then after the event, the same thing would happen. The same thing would happen. We'd come back, marching back. Well, for the ones that start, that were actually done a catch-it training area, on the way back, they thrash us again. So we had like three events. Oh, man, it was fucking hideous. It was hideous. Mm. It was hideous. Yeah. As if P Company wasn't hard enough. I know, yeah. 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 Yeah, but then I've heard I've heard little I've heard things in the past where like there's been milling going on for longer than a minute and stuff like that. You know, like, <laughs> what was yours like? What was your peak event like? Um What was your hardest event? Hardest event? Yeah, what did you find oh what did you find hardest? Mm, well, the Bugshi one was uh the Trinasia because that was just fucking this like a, <laughs> being on a fucking playground, <laughs> didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> being on a playground for the first part of the morning. Um hardest event for me. Probably um two mile. I used to struggle with a two miler. I think in depot everyone finds that hard. Mm. That became my bread and butter. Because I mean, you, two or three miles is a smash. You literally up. hit the hill straight away, don't you? Yeah. You're up the fucking hill, uh, and then you just. Oh yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So, the bus stop. Mm. When you start off with the bus stop, don't you? Yeah. Remember the bus yeah, stop? Bus stop yeah. 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 But then, um, but they're all, they're all fucking hard events. I mean, my, my, the one I dre- the one I oh, the one I dreaded was that, oh I found it most hideous was the stretcher race. Yeah. And I I'd broken my hand on million, and then uh, so one arm one hand I couldn't use. It was all wrapped up, so I couldn't hold the stretcher. So it's all on the one shoulder. Well, it's a stretcher, as you know. So it's not a stretcher, people. It's like a, it's two bits of scaffolding pole or something, with some bars across it. And on top of the scaffolding pole is tank tracks, steel tank tracks. It's just to replicate a thing roughly in the shape of a stretcher with four hand holding points that weighs. I don't know, 100, 150 k, something. Like 180, that. isn't it? 180, 180 k. I might be wrong. Yeah, four people can carry it, and uh, but you have there's like you have. So no, you, it'd be about 180 pounds. Is it 180 pounds? Oh, I don't know. Anyway. Um, 180 pounds sounds more sensible, yeah. yeah, about the weight of a person. So the, what you get is a luxury. If you get both hands are okay, you get luxury of swapping it from shoulder to shoulder. You know, when you're changing over and that. Well, I didn't have that, mate. So my one shoulder, ah, this is smashing up. I was fucked. My my shoulder was black next day. I was in clip. That was the worst one for me. Oh, because you get paired up on the um, stretcher, don't you? You get two. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah. Well, we nah, did anyway. We had like know. a team. Could you swap round? Oh, you have a team? Yeah. 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 And then you get the tall blokes, you know, yeah. you're paired up with the tall oh, bloke, the same yeah. height as you. And oh, if somebody yeah, drops yeah, off, yeah, 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 somebody yeah, comes yeah. off it, you're yeah. stuck with a bloke who's about half your size, yeah. so you're carrying all the weight. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember that happening. Yeah, hideous. Well, um, so going back to my question, what was it like? Did, 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 the, did the recruiting staff, not the recruiting staff, the DS, depot staff, how did they did they do anything to mentally prepare you for Afghan? Did you know you were going to Afghan? Did you know you were going to straight operation? Well, we knew that the blokes were in Afghan at the time. Oh, that's right. Well, you're on, yeah, so sorry, when yeah, we were yeah, training, they were yeah, they were in yeah, Afghan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, that book Three Power had just come out. Not well, probably about a year before. With uh, Patrick Bishop's one. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. yeah. And my platoon sergeant was um, in that book. One of the main. Well, there's a big write up on him. Is he still in? Uh, I'm not sure. Who was uh, what was the first name? Dan. Okay, cool. Yeah, so he was he was platoon sergeant, and he was you well, you know, you know. What your platoon sergeant in depot? Yeah. Ah, oh, oh mate. <laughs> <laughs> I am thinking of the right Dan, than I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he didn't take any fucking messing around. No, he does not. No. Yeah. But then there was obviously that there was you know people talking about what the things are happening but um training was just you know by the book really mm. so it's all about conventional warfare really you know there's no 
because that's what it had been on the first tour. Yeah. What I found interesting from my own perspective was um, after going on, this is reason I'm asking, after going on that first 06 tour, uh, in fact, in fact, oh, no, right. Yeah, so Column was in when you, Column was in platoon when you were there. Was Column. It? Column. Column. Mike Column. I don't know his first name. Scottish guy. Yeah. He was he was before me. Right. <clears throat> so I, what I re- retrospectively what I realised is that uh, my uh, I I got a lot, I was a, I became a lot less um, patient with um, you know when you're teaching like teaching you know like teaching you guys different stuff whatever whatever did you maybe. teach us anything fuck off uh, different stuff I became a, I was a lot less tolerant than I, I had been before because. I knew the impact. I knew. The, I, I remember. Oh, I was asked what column is. I remember flying off the handle at him. Flying off the handle at him. Come what it was. I think he'd kept his head up. We were just doing that, some training, blank firing, and he, he he was taking some shots, and he he stopped shooting, it, stopped shooting, and he, he he kept his head above the the not the parapet. He kept his head out of cover, looking when he wasn't firing instead of bringing it down. You know, <clears throat> and I remember f- flying off the handle, going mental. Because my, you get your fucking head blown off. Yeah, because you get your fucking head blown off. But then, if it had been five years before, not that I was in that position, before, five years before, but I would not have, I would have been more tolerant. I would, no, not tolerant, not like, oh, yeah, that's fine. But I approached it in a less fly out the handle kind of way. Yeah. And I wonder if, um, I wonder if that's, that, how the, how that experience, the, the experiences that the de- depot staff had, or, or people had that end up going to the depot after experiencing the, like the Afghan stuff, the, the, the conventional warfare seven oh six, almost sort of. Um, whether that impacted the quality of not your, I'm not about your era, I'm not before the quality of recruit coming out of depot, you know, because maybe maybe in general staff were more short uh, at a shorter fuse. Less, less, um, yeah, just short fuse, more like the fly of the handle, and so the teaching styles are impeded. I don't know. I don't know. Just pop it in there. Well, I've got nothing to compare it to. Depends on the individual, doesn't it? Yeah. Depends on the individual. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I've yeah. only had run, only ever had one training team, so I've got nothing to compare it to, really, mm. apart from other people's. Yeah. You know. But no, they were, they, they were hard on you, so that's all, that's what they're there for. Yeah. You got to, I, I don't think there should be any, I don't, I don't think you should be, if you can, if you've got a system where a management system where you can ensure that ninety nine point nine percent of the time you the staff and your direction, this could apply for multiple things, not just military. The staff and your direction are going to, are going to act morally and ethically and 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 in the way that is is most productive for producing the best soldier. Then you shouldn't have any fucking rules, really, no. because like for myself, my best scenario is don't give me any rules. I'll judge it as it goes, and depending on the recruit and the and you know and the platoon and all the rest of it. But unfortunately, you can't do it that way. No. It, it's it's uh, because you get morons. <laughs> yep. And it's it's a similar. Did you listen to the Ben Griffin podcast? You have to remind me who he was. And the Hereford he... lad who's now veterans for peace. Did he? He served in Iraq. Yeah, yeah, I listened to that one. Yeah, so in a similar way with the R, with the rules of engagement, <clears throat> it's like uh, like my like personally my ideal scenario is well, it's not have rules of engagement because I know I can trust myself to act morally and ethically and and I'll do what needs to be done, right, right, because it's stuff that there's certain as you know there's certain situations that you think right the best solution for this this problem and that it's a morally and ethical. A morally right and ethically, uh, morally acceptable and ethically acceptable solution, but I can't do it because the Geneva Convention says I can't, or or whatever, you know. Um, but again, you can't have that because you get morons, you know. Which is why I understand the stuff there. But then sometimes it, I remember thinking when we were in Africa, I remember thinking it's, it's, it's you fight an impossible battle because. Um, you, you, it's like playing chess. Here we go. This is what this is. This is the person, the perfect analogy. I can say this wrong. 
this is the perfect analogy. So this is where the Geneva Convention, uh, as an example of um, of a legal you know, legislative thing that binds soldiers, sailors, airmen's arms, a woman's arms as well, mm-hmm. um, against people like the Taliban, or an organisation like the Taliban, Al Qaeda, flipping uh, ISIS, right? Is that you, what what what's been told to us as a uh, a you as um, an organisation is okay? You've got an objective to achieve. You need to wipe out the Taliban, right? Or reform reform them, right? Um, but you've got to adhere to these rules. But they don't. So they they don't adhere to any rules. Just do what they want. So imagine playing a chess game. So you're whites and I'm blacks. Yeah, I've got to adhere to the rules of the game. Yeah. 100%. The knight can only move two places forward and one right. The bishop can only move diagonally, and the flipping pawn can only move one space unless it's first start off, and there's two spaces. That's my what I'm. That's what I've got to do. You are white. You can do what you want. Who's winning that game? I'm not winning the game, am I? Well, I can't play chess anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. There's no rules. You just make them up. No, I know. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. exactly what it is. Yeah. Exactly what it is. It's an absolute nightmare. Absolute nightmare. And in and in reality, I think, when it comes to... I mean, imagine we had like a, a world war or something. Not a world war, but like a, a war. Russia, mm-hmm. UK, mm-hmm. or Russia, UK, and US, or whatever. I would argue that those, like the Geneva Convention, other things, they're going out the fucking window. 100%. 100%. Because you could have UK and US versus Russia or China. And, you know, you start off adhering to it. Oh, we're doing, yeah, we're doing this. Blah, blah. And some of the other side isn't doing it. And they're getting a, a, an, an advantage or the upper hand in certain aspects. It's going to go out the window. But like, nah, done. Well, you know Been the Geneva Convention. You know the Geneva Convention we're gonna get came about, though, don't you? No, go on. So it was about soldiers in the battlefield, basically, that were lying there or dying. And people would come up and stab them in the eye and take up whatever valuables they had, that sort of thing. That's that's where the Geneva Convention came about originally. Go so after a, after, after a war, the, the, you know, you'd have so many people, you know, these were people that were, um, they were basically farmers that had to go and fight for the people who owned the land. That's the way a war worked back when, in the day. When are you talking about? Geneva. This the Geneva, Geneva no, Convention. No, when? When? Oh, I don't know. I don't know exactly the day. 19th century? 20th century? I'm not sure. But I know why it came about. It's because of, you know, they saw all these soldiers lying dead on the battlefield and um, or lying, dying on the battlefield. They had no help and people would just come up and fucking stab them and there needs to be some sort of, like, protection for people who enter, like, a wartime situation or fight for people that they had to fight for. You know, these are people that didn't want to actually do it. What about if there's no protection and the impacts of war are so catastrophic that people are more likely to avoid it? Hmm. What do you think about that, Chris Royal? Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. I'd have to agree. I didn't, hang on, I didn't make a statement. <laughs> I didn't say anything. No protection whatsoever. So no Geneva Convention. Yeah. And, uh, well, you'd just have anarchy, wouldn't you? And then you'd also have... No, you wouldn't. You've still got your laws, everything else. All it would mean is, this is all it means is, okay, you go to... Okay, so we go to um, Afghan. Mm. Imagine there's no Geneva Convention. You go to Afghan to operate, as we did, but there's Mm -hmm. no Geneva Convention, right? But we've got our own military law, yeah? An ROE, Mm -hmm. yeah? But no Geneva Convention. So, well, well military laws, um, card alpha anyway. No, card alpha, depending on where you are. Explain card alpha. Card alpha is... Yeah, uh, don't, don't, not to me, just you have to assume people know what we're talking about. Yeah, so card alpha is um, military... Um, Please don't get this wrong. What is it? Military... Well, it's a rule of engagement. It's, a, rules, it's rules, one of the rules of engagement. Of engagement. So, right. so uh, you cannot kill anybody unless they are... Uh, uh, a threat, an, Im- an immediate threat to human life. That's what card alpha is. So if somebody was to um, have a gun in their hand, they wouldn't necessarily be an immediate threat. 
if somebody was running towards some, if somebody had a knife in their hand, they wouldn't necessarily be an immediate threat. If they pull the weapon system up and aim at somebody, they are a threat to human life, and then you can engage. Yeah, Kyle Alpha, I'm pretty confident Kyle Alpha is not that good. 421422. Two, two. That's I'm pretty sure that's what Kyle Alpha no, is. No, 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 no. You just I, you've just described 421422. Two, two. Right. So uh, so people listening, you got rules of engagement ROE, right? And there's different types. There's loads of them. I mean, there's like a million of them that Chris and I didn't even know about. The main ones applied to uh certain himself and and Chris uh, was Card Alpha, which is the is it? I remember it's a Northern Ireland uh, rules of engagement uh, when I was in Northern Ireland, and that is um, you can't fire you can't fire at someone unless you were shot upon yourself. That's Card Alpha. I know. <laughs> Look at your face, <laughs> right? Unless you're shot upon. No, right. So weapon. Granted, this is how I'm recalling it. Weapon raised, pointed at yeah. you. Can't shoot them because they haven't endangered your life because they haven't shot. See. Um, there were caveats to that pattern setting. So, for example, so for example, weapon up shoots at me. Weapon dr- drops. I haven't got a chance to shoot me yet. Their weapon drops, right? So now they're no longer a threat to me. I can't shoot them. Mm. They run in. They go through another bit of cover. Weapon up shoots at me again, right? But for some reason, I'm able to shoot them again, right? So, weapon down. No longer a threat to me. However, they start running again. The pattern setting is the pattern they're probably going to take up cover. So I could shoot that person running, right? But Khan Alpha is generally, you can't shoot at them until they shoot shoot at you. Right, 421 and f- stroke 422, those rules of engagement, which are more... I don't know why they're two different numbers, more or less the fucking same. Um, 429 as well. So 421, 422 was uh, um, a threat to life. Like threat to life. So that would be weapon raised pointing at you. As, an ex- as a really crude example, you could shoot them four to one, four to two, and then four to nine was a, even less than that. Four to nine was something is something along the lines of um, no, this isn't this isn't me. This isn't a representation of how blasé I was of understanding the rules of engagement when I was serving. I knew them when I was serving, but it's been like it's been twelve years now. No, twelve. No, uh, eight years now. Um, but four to nine was. Um, uh, positively identifying a, an, an enemy combatant, you could kill them, whether they were pointing a weapon at you or not. Um, but obviously, <clears throat> in all cases, capture is the best option for intelligence. You know, uh, not in all cases, most cases. Uh, right. So yeah, how do we get to Carnal? Tell me about your most memorable, memorable time on your most positive. Experience. experience on the tour or it could be a single experience or no, it could be no. a, a positive fe- a positive thing what about well I think well we were never it was never convenient for us it was never like in a nice you know bastion camp with scoff going on we were always in the middle of nowhere mud wars around you and the, but the most the best part of the tour was the blokes that was it. Be with the blokes. Go on. Expand on that. I don't think you'll ever find any sort of bond or comradeship, you know, or getting on with somebody that you do when you're in a war zone with somebody. It wasn't technically us as a war zone, was it? It was a peacekeeping. Never but, mind technicalities. But, yeah, you never you never really get that bond and that with... Look, civvies don't understand it. They don't understand that... I think there's uh, some, like fire service and stuff in certain yeah. situations so yeah so if you're if you're ever in that situation where um it's life-threatening um it's dangerous um but you've got the blokes around you to keep you company and you know that's that's the best part of the whole tour really the the blokes what did you do in your downtime when you're in when you came off patrol because all all different people had crazy different things oh it depends de- depends what cpo is in when i was in quadrat we used to uh <laughs> make scuff <laughs> And yeah, go to the gym, you actually. Had, uh, <laughs> yeah, I tell you what I love about Quadro when we went there, right? Is that uh, we rocked up, uh, and you had, you had what you'd done is you you would have no correct me if I'm wrong, you you would each of you or a bunch of you would donate your you basically establish like a kitchen, 
place. <laughs> it wasn't a kitchen. We're talking like bits of rusty steel with some heat, some he- some like um, fire stoves underneath. Uh, you know, f- fucking fire stoves underneath to heat it up. Like a grill, and uh, you would donate your you would donate your ration packs and. And you donate some stuff you've been sent from home, and that would go in there, and that'd be like part of whoever the whoever the chef was for the day. It'd be part of their armory of ingredients. How did you work at the chefs? Who, who, what was that? No, 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 no. So was somebody that? somebody volunteered to do this, an all-in scoff. They make it. Who was the best chef? Um, I don't know. I made a couple of cakes for the blokes. It was Dave Pope's birthday. I made him a, a, a birthday cake. <laughs> and Luke Flanagan, actually, yeah. So remember that. <laughs> um, yeah, just um, well, we used to make our own stuff anyway, so we used to make our own flatbreads. So we used to get the issued stu- issued rations and then put some tomato in it, make some flatbread. And Don Fox used to come in with a just lay it out on the pan, just cook it on the pan, flatbread with full of yeah, brilliant. You ever do the screech bread? No. You so we make the, you make the footbread get the flour. We would mm-hmm. in with the car like screech in it. Yeah, we screech, mate. <laughs> screech. That sounds horrible. Yeah, it will. Yeah, but when you've been living on, so mate, like literally, must Carl. Did you mate, not just had, leave the screech out? Mate, we were on, we had potatoes, right? We had potatoes, yeah. and we had flour, yeah, right, <laughs> and we had ration packs. So you know, Freddie Cryer, no, no, right. So Freddie Cryer's the ink guy there, and um, Freddie Cryer's and combat dealers. You're combat dealers, no. He's like, oh, right, right, right. So we we uh, man, I was I was living, I was having, uh, oh, we had salt and vinegar as well. So I was having chips for breakfast. <laughs> Chips for lunch, <laughs> chips for dinner, non-stop, every day. <laughs> and the only thing I could, the only thing I could change the flavour was how much salt and vinegar I was putting on. So, obviously, you just get, right, more today. Right, next day, be more, more, more. <laughs> and, uh, and then Freddie started making uh, screech bread. Yeah, so so people listen, screech is uh, it's basically a weak it's an army or forces. Well, it's army, definitely. I don't know about Navy and Air Force. It comes in ration packs, so twenty four hour ration pack. It comes with a sachet, and it's it's orange. It's a it's a powder that you put into water to make it taste like orange squash. But it's <laughs> got a screech because it's screech because it's so fucking strong. <laughs> it's, it's hideous. And we were putting the screech in with the flour. We had like orange bread and uh, so lemon bread just for yeah, uh, 100%. just for appearances. <laughs> No, we tasted orange and lemon. It was hideous. It was a, it was a taste change. Oh yeah. So you just get it. You stopped to get scurvy yeah. as well. Yeah. So I mean, like a screech bread, screech bread, <laughs> stuff with uh, salt and vinegar chips. Well, I mean, you know, yeah, man, oh, I love it. <laughs> love it. Love it. Um, around that, oh, the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Most, so the most positive experience was the blokes. Yeah. Uh, most memorable experience. No, a few patrols, just just patrolling, right? Just the whole experience was obviously not all memorable, but you know the hairy the hairy situations are the most memorable. What was the closest you came to death? Um, we had a we had an op where we pushed north and we were trying to uh, flush out the uh, or trying to bring on the sniper threat. Um, we moved up north just before dawn. Um, sorry, just before dusk. No, just before dawn, sorry. And um <laughs> Mongan. Uh moved up north and we, we just basically occupied a, a compound. Just some, some blokes, some farmer, which was actually full of uh, poppies poppies anyway. We occupied his compound and then we made it look like there was only four blokes in the compound. So it was just like a rotation, like just Is that not with me? Yeah, you might have been there. Hang on a minute. The ambush? Mm-hmm. I was leading it, you fucking nutter. Yeah. Right. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah. Took- yeah, All right, go yeah, on. Yeah, but the thing is, though, <laughs> there was like I think it was before we went. Out, we went out at dusk. Yeah, we went out at yeah, dusk. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so we were all there. There was like fucking how many blokes? How many blokes were yeah. there? Five. Huh? Five of us. No, no, no. I'm it's, telling you, mate, it's, 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 it's a different one. It's a different one. Right. Okay. Good. Right. So a load we'll of blokes. Otherwise, a load of blokes went up. Right. Right. And, right, and right. It was like um, platoon strength, maybe even more. Yeah. Right, and dropped off five of us. No. Yes. No. Right. Go on. Keep talking. Anyway, so we set up this little makeshift um, stag position on top of a roof. Oh, no. Right. right? Okay, yeah, so we made yeah, up this makeshift uh, stag mine position. Mine was earlier And I think we had about... Th- there must have been over... Two strength, maybe right, more. Right, right? Okay. So you're talking like 30 plus, four, maybe 40 blokes in this compound ready to literally attack a position where we knew that fucking the sniper fire was coming from. So we were sat there 
All day. Fuck all happened. People just fucking getting their heads down. Nothing fucking going on. Um, next thing you know, right? Okay, we had enough of this. I think. Uh, I think um, the OC was running the patrol, and then he went right. Okay, right. Start moving blokes down in their uh, patrol groups, uh, platoon groups. Sorry, section groups. Um, blokes are moving out, and then eventually, I think we're left with about eight blokes in the compound, and everybody else had moved back down to um, fucking quadrat. So we were up there, eight blokes on our own. Then told you. No, no, no. We're slowly moving down. But, so we were the last oh. section to move. Me and Ray Mears are on top of the roof. <laughs> and uh, and the, he obviously, obviously information's getting passed fucking through the locals and they know what's going on. And next thing you know, a fucking, <laughs> they, they, we got this uh, oil drum as a makeshift, uh, well, part of the makeshift Sanger position on top of this roof. A round goes through the fucking oil drum. And me and Ray Mears are sat behind it. I'm like, fuck it hell. So we get down and, um, I look at Ray and he's like, "Oh shit, we've got to get off this roof." <laughs> Everyone, else, look, calling, calling, calling the comms. We're like, "Fucking come back!" There's, a, we've just been engaged. Nah, I can't be bothered now. <laughs> just, just sack it off. So, uh, right, gotta get off this roof. So I roll off the roof, like, and do a so- fucking side right and land and fucking get off. Ray Mears <laughs> stands up and starts running. The bloke fucking starts engaging him again. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a hairiest moment I remember. What was, what was the stupidest thing you did? Stupidest thing I did. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I think I, no, not stupid. That's the wrong word. It's something you did, and you look back and you think, oh, "God, why are you? What was I doing? Fucking lunatic!" No, but I do remember a situation where I was pointing my weapon system down a road, and then uh, I was we were crossing a crossing an MSR. Um, Go on, you have to explain. Main that. supply route, yeah. so a road, a road, yeah, main road. And um, <laughs> everyone was peeling, peeling through. <clears throat> yeah, okay. And I was, I had my weapon system pointed down the road. And uh, I wrote, right, okay, I'll move next. And literally got up, got onto the road, and where my crosshairs were aiming, <laughs> a bloke come out with an AK, jumped out of a bush, and just fucking sprayed up the road. <laughs> so I do, I do regret that. <laughs> You've been saying that those things happen, yeah. and you can't believe you're like, whoa, what the <laughs> fuck, you know? So like mental. I remember going in a... I think it was Davies, right? Remember Davies? Davis? Remember Davis? I think it was him. I remember being a... Uh, went sport coming in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it was him. <clears throat> I mean, you were... It was that tour. It was that tour. I think it was. And I remember going in to do, do on some fucking mission. On his... Uh, he gets up on a roof to... Prov- I think I think he's in the gym beyond LMG, and uh, he <laughs> a contact kicked off, but it kicked he, no, didn't kick off. He got engaged, <clears throat> so it was a couple of shots fired him, and it was like a tree line about four hundred meters away. And I said, <clears throat> I said, he said, uh, he said contact. I said, where the fuck did it come from? And he, I said, did you see it? He said, you give the tree line. I said, did you see it? See where it come from? He said, no. I said, right, get off the fucking roof. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you instantly regret a decision. I remember because <clears throat> there's a con- there was no more firing. No, right? But we had um, what, one or two rounds. It was one or two. It was yeah. one or two. I can't remember if it was one or two. I can't remember if it was one or two. I remember thinking, right? You know, you think, fuck sake, is he going to be? Is he going to be able to spot it? I thought, right, go off the roof, and he, he starts crawling back off the roof. Another shot comes over. I thought, right, I said, <clears throat> go on the net. I can't remember. The, I can't remember the snipers were because we weren't with. We weren't, wasn't that a quadrat? What, what, what was we? it? I can't remember. I can't remember. I remember crawling forward. I want to get on the roof and draw the fire again to be able to try as if I could. I'll be better at spotting this, <laughs> <laughs> mate. The tree line was like half a k long. It was massive. You know, you think just the, the, my logic was like, I can spot this. Right, let's just get up. So I'm, cr- I'm crawling forward. I like, sit there and I'm waiting for. I mean, exactly the position he was. I'm waiting for this guy. Could have been a girl on the tree line. Probably a guy. <laughs> right, probably a guy. Maybe there's equal opportunities. I'm waiting for this guy to fire again. I'm thinking, what the fuck? <laughs> what am I doing? What am I doing? Flipping nightmare. Didn't fire again. I'm like, fuck this. Get out of here. And then, cr- and then crawl off that, and then crawl off that, back off that roof. Because the guy, the, the fucking dude was assessed. Um, crawl back off that roof and encountered the largest Afghan fucking dog I've ever seen in my life. Do you remember the Afghan dogs? I saw, oh a, I saw a couple, yeah. 
Well, I see Afghan dogs. Remember the wolves? Mm. Jesus. This thing had a chain on it, like you'd see on some comedy sketch with the Hulk, mate. It's a Marvel movie to hold him back. It was massive. This dog was massive. It was here. I couldn't believe it. And then you got this massive, mega strong steel chain, the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life, holding a dog, and it's attached to a mud wall. <laughs> yeah, fucking hell. Mental. Mental. Um, what do you miss? Do you miss anything? Yeah, yeah, I miss. I miss being in. I miss being in um, Paris. Yeah, I miss the job. What do you miss about it? I don't miss. Um, no, I didn't ask that question. I don't miss fucking uh, being dick for fucking jobs and <laughs> not having you fucking leave. That's what I don't. Miss. That happens all the way through your career, but it doesn't yeah. get any better. I know. <laughs> change your fucking change your rank slide, and uh, you get fucking different dick and different dick. Yeah. More paperwork. Um, but no, I miss. I miss. Um, I miss. I just miss fucking the camaraderie. Yeah. Do you stay in touch with the guys? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my good friends. I still still speak to my good friends, and then I obviously come up for the uh, free fire free stuff. You know, I meet up with the other lads as well. Um, get to meet all those blokes as well again, and then I sometimes go down to Colchester. I haven't been down for a while, but yeah, I go down to Colchester mm. with the snipers and that. Oh yeah. dear. Yeah. I've been there for ages. No. Not in Cal- not not in the block. No. No, not in the block. Have they got a screws mess down there? Um, they had a screws mess when I left. Yeah. They, yeah, they made it. I think um, a couple of blokes fucking um, was it Eddie from Sigs kicked it out, made a bar and everything. Eddie. Eddie, yeah. Sig. Eddie, who? You know. Eddie. He was Sigs, and then he went patrols. No, probably. No, no, no idea. I don't know his first name. No idea. Yeah, kicked it out because uh, it used to be the old. Um, bed in store, didn't it? Wait, move. Ah, oh, that's where it is. Yeah, yeah. Ah, that's good. So, so you got the bed in store, which, yeah. and they've split it down into two, two power and three power, and then t- you've obviously got two different bars. Yeah. When we were in Hyderabad, right before, uh, what was it? We we in Hyderabad. Remember Op Fresco? What I don't know it? what the fuck am I about. You wouldn't remember it. Op Fresco. You might remember it when you were Sif Pop before mm-hmm. you joined up. Op Fresco was the was when all the firefighters went on strike. And the military took over the firefighting duties. Ah, uh, well, senior cheese told me about it. Oh my god! Like six months before we're going to green Iraq. goddess. Oh my god! Right. So in that time, so those green goddesses, nineteen fifties firefighting vehicles. Mm. They were right. We got a call, to, a shout out to a fire on Canvey Island, which was oh, like an hour away, right? And we were in the green goddesses. And on the way there, we got to talk to him around because the fire put itself out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate, it took ages. This thing is shit. And uh, we had a in camp bed in yeah. store, but in Hyderabad, the old barracks. It was like a stand like the one in Merville, standalone building. And uh, we had all these green goddesses in camp. We were training, and the bed in store went up in flames. <laughs> and we're talking. I mean, the size of the bed in store was like. Was it an in-house job? <laughs> probably. It was about, I don't know, it was maybe 10, I mean, maybe 5 or 10 metres wide by like 20 metres, maximum 20 metres long, not even that, 50 metres long. It's a tr- small building. We had five green goddesses around this thing, right? Could they put it out? F- Can you imagine five fire engines around it? Mate, smash it! Five green goddesses around. Because they had these, the green goddesses, right? I don't know if you've ever seen them up close. <sighs> They're these massive pipes, like like a 6-inch diameter come off. Off the off the off the off the truck. Green Goddess sorry, Green Goddess people listening is like a nineteen fifties fire truck, right? Which the army got issued to go and fight fires in two thousand and two. <laughs> and there were the firefighters going on strike. Massive like six inch pipe can off it, would deliver the water. At the end of the pipe, mate, these pipes reached about flipping five meters. Well no, let's say ten meters and they're not very far. And they were all like you know they get all ancient rubber, all cr- like dry and cracks not on it so you, you you roll it out and then at the end of the hose you'd have this this piece of steel probably fashioned in the medieval times with some weird lever on it you turn and let the water out but the hole on the end of the steel was tiny and the pressure that the, the green goddess could deliver down the pipe was tiny so what you ended up was this yeah, loads of like sort of Kit that looked good in the 1950s, but the pressure was like a garden hose. So, you know, you, 
he better off pissing Piss- on the fire. It's like five guard, uh, green goddesses around this fire on a flipping building in Hyderabad. Couldn't put it out. Burnt itself out. Hideous. Flipping hideous. Yeah, how do we get onto that? Um, don't know. Uh, oh yeah, missing the blokes and that. Oh, you go back to you go back to you go back to Collie, don't you? Mm. Back to Collie. So we're talking about this corporal's mess. Yeah, screws mess. Yeah. Um, did you? Did you when you had our when you were due to go on your R and R? In uh, when you were out in Afghan, mm-hmm. what was that experience like before? Before we went on R and R, well, I was in. Um, is it No Mohammed? No, 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 Mohammed. Luke's checkpoint, wasn't it? No, his was uh, Nikila Bakale. Oh, no, the village was near Kila Bakale. Norm Hammer was the CP, yeah. Yeah. So, um, basically, what happened What happened was, um, there was a patrol going out in that area at that particular time. They said, right, you can't go down there because the Taliban are there. So, t- oh, yeah. It typical- was essential that was no-go area. Yeah. Bizarre, right. yeah. So, so, we were like, fuck that. So, I think the OC was like, right, we're sending some fucking blokes down. And I got attached to the group, so did Briggsy. So, to send the snipers as well. So we all got, well, me and Briggsy and whoever else got attached to the group and we went down there and uh, occupied a compound. Right, you're only going out for a couple of days. Right, cheers. So I took a day sack. Day sack, minimal kit. Oh. <laughs> oh, Typical. I've been there <laughs> on the tours before. I've been there. <laughs> Typical fucking shit. So I turn up, two days, right. Yeah, we're going to be here for uh, the foreseeable future. <laughs> Bear in mind, Zulfikar was only just down the road. Yeah. But all my fucking kit was there. I'm not talking about important kit. I'm not talking about serial kit or anything like that. But like all my fucking my w- stuff that I'd want to take back home, yeah. like, you know what I mean, was there. Anyway, um, so we just fucking stayed there the whole time. Didn't have any kit. And uh, I remember, right, your R&R's up, right? They're coming down with the Mastiffs now to pick you up. I was like, right, okay. Mm. And I can't remember who it was in the um, in the Mastiff, but I didn't want to look. I ain't got my fucking... Docks or anything like that, they're all in, in Zulfikar. Is there any way we can fucking stop off and pick them up? Oh my up? god. Hey, cause you wouldn't leave out your passport on that, we would you? wouldn't be able to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's like, right, okay, yeah, no worries. <laughs> so we literally <laughs> just turn up, the convoy's going down the fucking road, turns left, and it stops. And actually, you know, the OC comes on the road, what the fuck's going on here? We stopped on the fucking, and I had to fucking <laughs> run out the back of the fucking Mastiff into Zulfikar, pick up my fucking kit that I needed to take just go on leave and then fucking run back in the back of the Mastiff and then uh, and then we fucking went off up to uh, Kamar wasn't it Kamar Kamar yeah yeah, Kamar, yeah. Right, then, uh, we, as Jared told you about when we uh, you might not have we were <clears throat> it was on the second on the 08 talk Jingli truck no that was 06 oh, that was okay. Scarlet no 08 right no. so the same thing <laughs> you have the foreseeable future so why you sat in 08 was <clears throat> so we were my team so the sniper team were attached to a company mm-hmm. now for some fucking reason we'd always be the last to know about anything if we were told at all right so we form up we get told we're going to do a, a we're in the dashed desert and we're going to do a um a raid into a, an attack into um what was the area bandy i think it's called bandy team or and we're going to do a raid in, in, in there so we form up like big op um Middle of the fucking middle of the middle of the night, sort of morning, two two or three o'clock in the morning. And we sat there ready to go, so you can't see anything. Like pitch black, day sacks on, good ready to rock up. I've like literally sat down in the formation at the go, and then and you get because of the net right, we're moving, and you get I'll start patrolling off. Still pitch black, right? We get in there, we do the shit, then we get into a compound, establish ourselves, and and we're on a day sacks, literally with nothing. With fucking nothing, mate. Right? I always used to put in the bottom of my day sack on that tour. I had this um, parasilk hammock. Mm-hmm. I just, just in case. Now, it would pack down to the size of, I don't know, uh, remember them, them small footballs you used to get? Remember you get the big football and the little footballs? Yeah? Pack down to the size of that. Whacking to the bottom of the day sack, you never knew. Um, and we get in this compound. And, uh, and something gets said other than that. I can't remember what it said. Anyway, the indication was. Of it, what I can't remember what I said, but it was like, were you overnight? And I'm like, all right, well, we, we ain't part for that. It's not a major drama. You can get through one night, right? 
with not having any kit, can't you? You know, but yep. the, the rations is the immediate implication, mm -hmm. right? You always carry 24 hours. We have some for the day, so we had two days rations, yep. right? Yep. Baz. Baz. <laughs> what was going on? Did that <laughs> did that go over the uh, the recording? Did it did it go on the recording? Did it? All right, people people didn't hear that. We had uh, the sound of a chinook coming through the uh, ear holes. Uh, yeah, so so fuck where was I? Oh yeah, so it was like like okay, we're gonna have two days. But then so I went and seen uh, the sergeant major at the time. We should have made our names. Wait, how long are we here for? Six days. What? Six days. Mate, we're in day sacks. He said, yeah, yeah, the Burgans are, the Burgans are getting full of The Burgans are coming in. Burgans? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a, it ended up being an eight day op. Everyone knew they were going for like six days. Everyone had been told, except for me. So so my team didn't know. So we'd gone in with day bugs? sacks. It was me, it was me, Jared Cleary, Doug Hook, Briggsy. <laughs> Mate, it was hideous, right? Me, Jared Cleary, Doug Hook, Brig, yeah, Briggsy, uh, someone else, which I can't name. Yeah. And. H. No, no, no. Ah. Uh, the, yeah, was, there was five of them, mm -hmm. right? Oh my god. <laughs> and the position we occupied, we were on, we were on a roof. Because because where we had the sniper snipe, sniper sanger it was on a roof, maybe sleeping in the open. We had nothing, like nothing. And it was you know it's like daytime is warm in Afghan, right? Yeah. But nighttime, oh you did a winter tour, didn't you? In the summer, even in the summer, when night when it comes to nighttime, yeah, okay, it's like twenty twenty degrees maybe. But when the temperature of the day is been like forty odd, the nighttime because that big difference is freezing. Jared and I, mate, we put a so a parasilk hammock on the roof, mud roof, right? Laid it down as if that would give it any warmth. Then we got, you know, sandbags. We got empty sandbags, right? This is on a second night because we were fucking freezing. Everyone's in the same position. As in, just my team. Yeah. Everyone else knew about burgers. We haven't been fucking told. And then, uh, so we got sandbags. We, we stripped the sandbags, opened it out, and we sewed them together. And Jared and I sewed a double blanket out of sandbags <laughs> together. And we had this parasol, like, might as well be laying on the fucking roof. And then this sandbag blanket on the top of us. It was hideous. It was the worst, the worst time ever. <laughs> fucking freezing. Mate, right. hideous. Yeah, nightmare. Nightmare. And then, uh, yeah. But then, then the contrast, we did it. I remember doing another one. Might be. No, it wasn't the same op. Remember doing another op and going in and we're like right in the compound and uh and every, for everyone we stayed a couple of days longer than we should have, but for everyone it wasn't a planned thing. But this the compound we took over, it had a plum orchard. Oh, that hammock went straight up between two plum trees, mate. And like and we weren't doing much between stags. And I'd be laying in the hammock, and if I was hungry, I would literally just wriggle about in the hammock, and plums would just drop <laughs> onto me. I'd eat plums for two days solid. I was shit into the eye of a needle. Fucking <laughs> horrendous. It was horrendous. Yeah. Afghan, weird. Good fucking the time, mega times and shit times. Mm. Like. Yeah, really good, really good. Um, we've got like five minutes left. Okay. Uh. Anything you want to talk about? Are you sure? Yeah. You know that carbon thing was bullshit, right? Was it? No, not bullshit. So they've got this machine that can extract carbon from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the problem is not extracting carbon from the atmosphere. The problem is re it into the ground, which you can't just do that. It was turning it into a liquid form. Yeah, you can't just put it into the ground, though. It's got to work in the same form. The problem is don't take it out in the first place. Which is oil. That's one of the ways, yeah. 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 So stop doing oil. Yeah, we stop, stop. Stop digging oil out the ground and uh, look for other means. Yeah. Part of the problem with the... So, what I was listening to that podcast the other day was... Um, um, we basically got... Uh, we got one generation to turn it around. So, mm. we got one generation to become carbon neutral. Now, if we're able to do that, the impact is going to be the best case scenario, which is a two-degree increase in global warming over the next something like... 50 years that two degree that's best case and that's happening we can't if we all went carbon neutral today it still happen still happen right right but that two degrees that means even that two degree 
means Bangladesh. Cheers, cheers, fellas and ladies. Gone underwater, like masses of just going underwater. Done, gone. Um, but the problem with the uh, the environmental efforts and like the oil side of things is mm-hmm. like we can go, yeah, recycle and oh, we should. Mm-hmm. We should set the example. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, um, reduce fossil fuel usage. Blah blah blah. We ain't the whole world. No. You know, and how do you, how do you convince? How do you go and convince? Like Africa's got a massive problem for like, like you think, plastic pollution, um, and stuff like that. How do you how do you go and convince some, you know, some third world country individual or family and go look? Whoa, 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 whoa. We well, can't, can you? You see that plastic bottle that you're using? All those plastic bottles you're getting by the aid agency that you're using to go and, you know, to survive every day with that water, collected from the whatever, or this, that, and the other. You need to stop doing it. Well, just, 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 or just try and use the same bottle all the time. Well, in that respect, they probably will use the same bottle. They'll probably keep the bottle. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you talk about places like China, where they're producing so much fossil, well, burning so many fossil fuels and producing so much pollution. Their argument is, you know, the Western world's already had their opportunity to make their wealth. Now they see this as their opportunity, um, and you're never going to convince them. They're, right. you know, they they want to build their their country. They want to um, build their economy. They want to they want to be more. They want to be a world player, and this is how they're doing it. I think. I think in, instead of uniting people in that um, carbon emissions reduction and be environmentally friendly instead of uniting the world, which is what needs to happen mm-hmm. to get to that stage within and go car and go carbon neutral as close as you can within thirty mm-hmm. years. It's it's not possible. I think what's more likely to happen is pe- countries are, are going to realise we are fucked. We need to be on top of all our resources if we want to survive. We're going to be the last one standing. Yeah, which is oh, you think they go? I think I don't know. I well, it's, it's worrying as a parent anyway. You just don't know which way it's going to go. Mm. Mm. Uh, we're all doomed. Well, we're right. We're doomed anyway. But our life's been right. <laughs> uh, your your son, yeah. if you want to join the Reg, would you go? Yeah, go on. Um, I just weigh up the pros and cons with him and let him make his own decision. I wouldn't influence him anyway. Well, you are because you're a Reg. <laughs> well, okay, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't go out to influence him anyway. I'd, I'd I'd just tell him the way the good things the pros and the cons and let him make his own decision. I wouldn't um, want to force it upon him. Cool. Yeah, and if okay. anyway, if I wanted him to do it, I'd probably want I'd want to go as an officer. What about if he want what? Yeah. Uh, what about if he uh, what if he wanted to what if he believed in Scientology? Then that's his decision. Oh God, I would argue that one. I'd argue that one. Well, yeah, case. I'd fucking debate <laughs> it with him. But if he wants to be a fucking Scientologist, that's his Sam, choice. I'm going to try and influence you. <laughs> Mate, been a pleasure. Yeah. Cheers, Hugh. Cheers.